At 7 o'clock, I'd like to call the meeting to order. I'd like everyone to please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kelly, would you call the roll, please? Here. Here. James Shiloh. Here. Julian Davey. Here. Michael DeVito. Here. Eric Jones. Present. Kristen Lynn. Here. The quorum is present. Thank you. Um, are there any changes to the agenda as proposed? Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as proposed? Mm -hmm. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Mm -hmm. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call. Jones? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Wren? Yes. Shiloh? Yes. Davey? Yes. Dito? Yes. Dombeck? Yes. Motion carried. Is there a motion to approve the NIA consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Roll call. Nelson? Yes. Wren? Yes. Shiloh? Yes. Davey? Yes. DeVito? Yes. Jones? Yes. Dominic? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. At this point uh, in the meeting, I would like to convene a public hearing on the NIA budget. Is there anyone uh, here this evening who would like to speak to the NIA budget? Anyone who would like to present written materials about the NIA? record should reflect that no one came forward to speak or to present materials, and I will uh, close the hearing. Next item, uh, item is audience to visitors. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board this evening on any issue? Okay, if you would uh, come forward and state your name. You have three minutes. <laughs> I'm Jessica McClure, and I went to school at Sycamore from west to graduation, and um, we came back to raise our kids here soon. I just wanted to thank you as a board for um, maintaining the sex ed standards that we currently have and not adopting the second edition of the National Sexuality Education Standards. It represents my values personally, so I appreciate it on that level. But also, I appreciate that it um, that it leaves space for individuals and families to address those topics as they see fit. Um, so I just wanted to thank you. This is a wonderful place to raise our kids, and um, I love being able to trust my kids' educators and give them the experience that I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board this evening on any particular topic? Okay, then we'll move on to the next item, which is communications, correspondence, informational items, letters and newsletters. There are several letters out there, or newsletters. Yeah, the, the big game is coming up, uh, like, right away. <laughs> it's almost, it's too soon. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't been, had a chance to breathe yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's been a great start to the year, but the big game is right around the corner this Friday. So, yeah. yeah. That was our materials. So. Yeah. Um, FOIA requests, there were two. Both of them have been responded to. Uh, committee reports. Uh, I would just say SEF has take groups coming up, I believe it's September 10th, if I'm not mistaken. So just a reminder that's buy tickets and participate and help contribute to SES so they can help the district. And yeah, we're going full speed ahead, right? Full speed ahead. <laughs> Summer's over. Yeah. It's all over. Any other committee reports? Um, Old North Grove School. I don't know if any of you have Farm Bureau Connections magazine. They did a, a, a lot of articles about schools, old schools and Old North School had a prominent um, article. It was very well done. You can get a hold of that now and read it. It's just kind of a nice thing. And they're having a Pumpkin Fest open house on October 29th and a holiday open house on November 26th. So if you've never been there, you might want to go out and visit and see what's going on. I think you, you saw in um, C 
Steve's update this week in the finance subcommittee did meet late last week. Um, but it sounds like we'll, that, that was mostly just a preview of what we're going to hear tonight. So I, I didn't have any additional questions really beyond what Nicole already presented. So I'll chime in appropriately later this evening. But, but okay. Any other committee reports? Assistant Superintendent for HR. Thanks, Jim. Um, every year, uh, Yvonne Johnson, and I see Dan out here as well, DeKalb County Community Foundation, um, recognize five educators or five individuals working in education for being amazing people. Um, so we have our nominees here as well as our winners. Um, it's not brand new news. This happened late June that they were recognized, but this is the first meeting we can get our five people here with summer vacations and stuff. So we still wanted to make sure we brought them in. Um, so here's some of the, the nomination requirements. Um, Nicole's going to take that, so I'm not multitasking. <laughs> so here's some of the requirements. Um, and then there's five different categories. And, and we'll acknowledge our, our staff members um, in those areas. A lot has to do with community and collaboration, if you were to read through this. Um, and, and our five uh, nominees and then some of our winners uh, exemplify this. So our first. I'm going to read a lot. I normally don't like to read what's on the screen, but um, what, what we started doing, what I really like to do, and I, I'm kind of lucky that I get to read what other people say about our employees uh, through this process. And I know these individuals probably are going to feel uncomfortable and wouldn't want um, for us to be going through this, but I think it's really important. So for those that are watching at home or will later on, um, I'm going to read through these, even though I don't normally like reading through. So our first nominee um, is in the support staff. Um, area and that's Heather Ralph at West so uh, Heather Ralph is the principal secretary at, at West um, so I know you love so uh, from a parent uh, Mrs. Ralph is very welcoming and supportive my daughter loves seeing her each morning uh, from a staff member she's a special gift and we are so lucky to have her at West Mrs. Ralph is the engine that keeps West School moving forward. Mrs. Ralph truly is the face of West School, and we wouldn't be the same school without her caring, selfless, and fun personality. So those were from um, some of her colleagues at West. Uh, from a student, simply, you are the best. You always make everyone feel at home. I have not known another student. I have not known you long, but when I first met you, I was like, wow, I hope you don't retire. <laughs> um, from another student, our principal must be so proud to have you. Uh, and then from a new principal, so from uh, Emily Waller, uh, as a new principal to the district in West, I'm incredibly thankful for Heather. Heather truly is the heart and soul of our building. So, Heather, uh, please stand and uh, so we can give you a So now we'll ask you to come up in front of everyone on camera, Heather, um, so Jim can give you an award from the board. nominee was the uh, middle school nominee, Amy Tanaki. Mrs. Tanaki has boosted my confidence in my personal life, so from student. Uh, her teaching style revolves around her values of integrity and community. Her enthusiasm towards progress is inspiring, and there's no doubt in my mind that she loves her job. Still, those are from students. Um, again, she is and always will be here for us. From parents, Amy helped our kids find self-respect, peer respect, and self-esteem. It was clear that our children felt valued by her. I'm going to give her husband Ken a little shout out here because this is about both of them. But they are among the first people our kids uh, on their kids' visit list, so when they come home from college. We strongly feel that Amy has earned all the recognition she has been nominated for just as she has earned a trusted and valued place in our family. And then uh, a little story to share from your colleagues. Um, <laughs> Yeah. During the fall of COVID, morale was low amongst teachers. 
we were each teaching in our separate classrooms, talking to students online, hoping we were making connections, but wondering if we were making an impact on our students at all. One afternoon, we received a video from Amy. She had videotaped the Google Meet of our sixth graders. Each student took turns playing the next measure of Frog in a Tree until they had played it from the beginning to end. It wasn't perfect, but I will never forget the look of concentration on the faces of our students as they played from their bedrooms, living rooms, and basements. I remember my teammates and I coming out of our classrooms, some of us with tears streaming down our cheeks. Amy had shown us that during this incredibly rough time of our lives, it was still possible to create something beautiful together. So that's from a cow. So, Amy Tanaki, come on up. Category Drake Nagelson. So Drayton, see you. Uh, so from a student, I look forward to it being in the classroom environment every day as I walk to the choir room. Drayton's passionate and contagious energy bring life to all of his undertakings. It's from a colleague. He emphasizes the importance of community service and outreach to his students. He meets challenges and conflicts with forward thinking, solutions, and always strives to make student-centered decisions. Drayton is truly one of the kindest and most genuine people that I know. And kind of all summed up, Drayton Eggleson is the best part of Sycamore. Um, another story to share, Drayton. So I know this will bring great to you. So um, no, last year, and this was, if you remember, this award was last year. So 2021, really. So again, kind of from the heart of COVID. Remote teaching, uh, Sycamore staff, and this was district-wide, had the down... Uh, had the opportunity to participate in a live video professional development session with A.J. Giuliani, if you guys remember when we were doing work with him. Very well-known national uh, speaker and educator. During the downtime leading into that call with the entire district on Google Meet, everyone's watching, um, Drayton, with a little urging from some others, began singing the Sycamore Fight song with, with everyone around during this, this lull. I can tell you because I was sitting in a room with quite a few people uh, that the smiles that brought, the laughter, the sense of community, as several of us started singing along with him, it was magical at a time when most of the educators in the room were at a low point in their career. But there was Drayton bringing joy and reminding us all why we were here and that we were all Spartans. Um, AJ uh, right away said, this is amazing. I've never <laughs> been on a call like this. And that was started by Drayton. So again, someone who embodies what Sycamore is great things. high school recipient in the county. Um, our next one uh, was the administrator recipient. So I'll just turn right to you, Nicole. This is completely out of her comfort zone. Um, Mrs. Stuckert is a wonderful role model to girls like me and shows that you can be successful in your career while raising a family. So this was from a student in our district. There are many decisions that can be made at the district without her being involved. Uh, that was a student recognizing that. I can attest to that. Um, always have to go to school. She is very responsible and cares deeply about the Sycamore School District. I hope I am able to have a boss like her in my future. Again, these are all from students so far. Uh, she is visionary and considers new programs that have, have long-term validity. These are from colleagues. Nicole is a person of knowledge and perseverance who maintains a high level of professionalism. She is a proactive and compassionate leader and dedicated to her family, work, and community. Nicole Stucker, the other recipient. You gotta get up and go get your own. Oh, you gotta get a picture. <laughs> 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 
And then our last uh, person to, to be uh, acknowledged here was the elementary recipient for the county, um, and that's Lisa Winters. Uh, Mrs. Winters was that teacher who connected to my heart, not just my head. Mrs. Winters made me feel important. Mrs. Winters seemed to magically intertwine math in absolutely everything. <laughs> this is true. I <laughs> Mrs. Winters' ability to make me always feel important, worthy, and intelligent. Her work as a learning coach is changing the way that we educate students daily. Lisa has the ability to make every teacher feel valued and listened to. She is simply one of the best educators I've ever known. And I can tell you, these are things that kept coming up in comments um, from her whole team, um, from any, everyone, was how she values them um, and makes them feel that way. I, Coming into to my position a couple years ago, and Mr. Rice said the same thing coming into his, we didn't, don't have much elementary experience, so when we reached out to people, the common thing people said was, well, you got to talk to Lisa Winters. Whether they be teacher or principal, you got to talk to Lisa Winters. So we kind of leaned heavily on her, and, uh, and she's been amazing. So stand up, be recognized, and come get your work. Congratulations to all our uh, honorees and to our award winners. And, um, just really appreciate your efforts and the efforts of our entire staff and our, our, all of our teachers. And, um, you know, we don't get to say that often enough, I don't think, and we don't get to celebrate this often enough. So it's really, it's really good to have an occasion like this where we can uh, smile and laugh a little bit and, and celebrate. And so thank you for all that you do every day, day in and day out. Uh, whether it's uh, over the summer or whether it's during the school year or whenever, uh, I know you're always on, you're always on, on duty. So thank you very much. And it's one of the things that makes Sycamore a special place. And so I think you can say that Sycamore is a great place to, to raise your kids, raise your family. So that's in large part to the people that are in this room. Thank you. Um, that brought us all down, right? <laughs> now, now on to uh, Assistant Superintendent for Business. Um, the first item you guys have in front of you tonight is the approval of the um, 23 budget for NIA. So we don't have some months on for tonight, but um, so tonight we're just asking you to you guys that. Is there a motion to approve uh, the resolution presented regarding the from your 23 NIA budget. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Roll call. Shiloh? Yes. Davey? Yes. DeVito? Yes. Jones? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Wren? Yes. Dombe? Yes. Motion yeah. I'm just getting to the good part, so I don't know why they <laughs> I do. <laughs> I don't blame <laughs> Okay, so now um, we're ready to talk about more budget. So this is the tentative budget. Um, so first, first glance at this for you guys. As Eric um, mentioned before, uh, we were able to meet with him last week and get more preview, um, kind of go in depth on some things. And so um, I'll go through our presentation right now. All right, so first I just want to talk about um, where we ended FY22. And I want to remind the board that these are unaudited financials, so um, these numbers will change after we do our full entrance um, with the auditors. Um, but as you can see, if you look to the right there, uh, for the current year, um, year to date, current year budget, excuse me, um, our surplus was about $732,000. 
um, which is good. But we do know that number is probably going to go down when we do um, our expense approvals. Uh, we did have a projected um, surplus, um, a little bit smaller than that, around $350,000. So I expect to be somewhere around that um, dollar amount once we get everything done in the audit. Again, this is just um, the projected number. Um, we our graph that you guys are used to seeing, this is our fund balance for the entire year. Um, this is typical to what our fund balances look like throughout the year, just with our large tax payments coming in um, at the end of June and also at the end of September. So looking at our budget goals, these have been our goals for the last couple of years, um, working towards a balanced budget, which we have done um, for quite a while now. Um, strengthening our fund balance for our board policy, so we know we were below that 25% threshold for a long time. Um, we've currently surpassed that, um, so with these unaudited numbers, we're at about 30%. Um, so we've gone up and above that 25% um, that we're required to have. Also, another budget goal of ours is to continue to not have tax anticipation warrants. That's something that we haven't had to do now for a couple years, um, and so I'll get into that a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, again, continuing with our goals to be transparent, have our financial dashboard now that's out there, um, and so we're able to put out our financial reports every month for the public to take a look at, um, to have open conversation and communication with everyone, um, and then um, making sure that all stakeholders understand, articulate, and support um, our mission. So we've got that budget report as a goal of ours. We didn't quite get to it at the end of last school year, but that's something that I'm going to work on um, with more and um, coming into front of the So we'll get that rolling for the FY23 budget. Okay, so now we'll start to talk about revenues. As we know, revenues. Um, Local revenues is one of our largest uh, percentages at about 70%. And then we receive um, state funding, about 22% of that. And then we do get a little federal funding that's about 8% of our budget. I'm not going to go through all these, but I do want to touch upon um, some of the um, key indications here. So taxes, we know that um, our CPI came in at about 7.5% last year. Um, because we are tax capped, we're only able to capture 5% of that. So that would be our levy for um, 22 that I'll be presenting to you guys in October. CPPRT, we know we had an anomaly of a year last year. All those federal funds that were going to the businesses were trickling down. So we actually doubled our CPR, CPPRT revenue for last year. Um, that's going to go back. Um, but we are anticipating an increase of what we received um, in prior years to that, about $300,000. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out um, is our, uh, our tuition, our instructional fees that we charge our families. We've really not seen a dip in that over the last few years, which is interesting, even um, uh, just with people who were maybe struggling to make payments. Um, our free or reduced numbers are pretty stable also. Um, so those numbers will probably just be flat um, for this for this coming school year. The other big thing is uh, food service. So um, we are going back to having designations. So we're no longer able to feed all of our children for free. Um, there are some schools that are able to do that because their entire uh, free and reduced population is over 50%. We don't have that at Sycamore. Our free and reduced population tends to be between 25 and 30 percent um, district wide. Um, so we are going back to having free, reduced, and then paid students. So we do receive a lower reimbursement rate um, with our paid students. <clears throat> On the state side, evidence-based funding. So to much surprise to us, um, we received um, word that we are moving tiers. So we're moving from tier two to tier one. Um, it's it's good and bad news. I guess you can take that. Um, moving to tier one means that we're further away from our advocacy target. Um, the good side of that is we will receive some additional funding, about $450,000 uh, additional funding for moving tiers. Um, the information that we've received, um, we've pointed this out also, is a lot of 
districts that are moving tiers are due to um, capturing those enrollment declines. Um, so I guess we're falling into, into one of those categories. Um, transportation, we'll probably receive um, some more transportation state funding just because we have more students riding the bus. Um, so this will report on the state numbers from FY22, so we'll start to receive that revenue in FY23. Um, the last two years, well, obviously some kids weren't even writing at all, um, and so we did see those numbers decline, but um, I anticipate those numbers to go back up. On the federal level, um, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, um, we are receiving about $1.2 million for ESSER 2 that we'll spend in this current school year, but that money um, coming in is that money going out, so it's just a flow through, so it's not additional money that um, we'll be seeing in the coach towards our fund balance. Um, ESSER 3, that money was to be spent over three years. We're really going to spend that money over two fiscal years. Um, and so again, we'll see that money come in, but then that money will go out um, and spent on mostly staff for that ESSER 3. And again, the lunch program, I already um, touched on that with the designation changes. Any questions? Um, Uh, I have a quick yep. question. The uh, use of the uh, CPPRT as a portion of local taxes, do you, do you know offhand like, how much of the local taxes are derived from that CPPRT versus like just you know, local property taxes from residents? That's heavily weighted to residents in Sycamore compared to DeKalb, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the percentage off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, right. Is it, do you think? Some majority, right? Eighty percent probably comes from single family and multi family. Oh no! So CPPRT is from corporate, so it's corporate personal property replacement tax. Mm -hmm. So that so it's not coming from okay. the residential. And it's not a very big number. No, no we get no. about typically about five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred to six hundred thousand. We're supposed to get eight hundred thousand dollars. Okay, one percent. So <laughs> and, that is, and that ultimately is what the appeals come through when they're asking for those abatements or criminal. No, 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 nothing to do with local property taxes. This, this is all business. Oh, okay. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the expense side, um, salaries and benefits are our largest expenses. Um, and then we do uh, pay out some purchase services, um, supplies, capital outlay would be any equipment that is over $1,500. Other objects would be our dues and fees, and then our non-capitalized equipment is uh, any equipment that's under that $1,500 threshold. So some things I want to touch on on um, the expenditure side. We've really been working on these budgets since um, December. We um, work with our uh, department chairs and then working with our building principals and our program managers. Um, we do a lot of legwork behind the scenes, um, meet with them. Um, so just for reference, um, our building budgets, our department budgets, and then our programs, which would be our Oscar, Oscar Junior program, um, those are pretty much flat um, from the year prior to that. Really the only increase that we're seeing, and I brought this up to Eric too, is um, our fuel cost from the transportation perspective. Um, so actually that budget is up about 15% just because we're not sure where those numbers are going to go. Um, but technology was down, um, SPED is down, learning and teaching is down a little bit also. So those kind of balanced each other out, so we came in flat with that. Um, those, all those budgets make up about 8% of our overall budget, so it's not a large chunk, um, but we do um, try to keep an eye on them. So again, our largest expenditures are going to be our salaries. Um, so we do have three groups that we um, negotiate with and have a bargaining agreement with. So our SEA, our certified teachers, um, we have a contract with them through fiscal year 26, so those salaries are set. Um, our SESA group are our paraprofessionals. Um, we just finished their contract, so they have a contract through fiscal year 27. And then our custodial maintenance staff um, have a contract through fiscal year 25. Um, so that really assists us in projecting out um, what our salaries and benefits are going to be um, in years to come. Um, we 
also know from a salary perspective is minimum wage. So we had to make sure we got all of our non-certified staff up to that $13 threshold. And so this budget also reflects that. From a benefit side, I did just want to touch on what the, the board is statutorily required to, um, to pay on behalf of all of our employees. So um, TRS and THIS, those are for our certified staff. So TRS is our retirement. Um, the employer is um, required to put in 0.53% and the employee 9%. Um, per the contract, the board pays the employee portion. Um, so TRS total is 9.53. Um, the THIS is for certified employees are then, um, that is their insurance after they retire. And so they put in a percentage, the board puts in a percentage, um, and then they're able to utilize that upon retirement. So again, the employer um, pays 0.67%, that's the employer portion. The employee portion is 0.9%, and the board pays 0.8% of that. Um, again, that's for the contract. IMRF is our retirement fund for our non-certified staff who work over 600 hours a year. Um, the board, um, the employer portion of that is 9.04%. And then everyone pays into Medicare, um, all employees do. The board is required to put 1.45% in for that. And then our non-certified staff pay into Social Security. And again, the employer has um, a percentage that we have to put in for that. And then, of course, we offer health insurance to all of our full-time employees. Any questions on expenditures? Uh, on the big pie chart, can you comment the, the slide right before that? Yep. I know usually our salary benefits is closer to like 70, 80 percent. I'm assuming that this pie chart reflects expenditures still from the um, the construction bonds, <laughs> the, the site improvement bonds. Is that a portion of this expenditures? Um, actually, yes, that would be in that 14 million right there. Okay. Right here. Yeah. That's so we have about um, eight million dollars in construction costs that we'll pay out of this budget. <clears throat> okay, so this um, ending fund balance, this is straight from our ISB state budget form. Um, this is looking at a deficit budget summary um, that we're required to um, put together. This is just our operating funds. So again, if you guys remember when we had to do a deficit reduction plan in the state, it's always based off of your operating funds. Um, so that's our educational fund. Um, our operations and maintenance fund, our transportation fund, and our working cash fund. Um, so again, you can see this is just looking directly at revenues versus expenditures. Um, the difference there is a, is a total surplus of $27,000. Um, and then what our estimated fund balance uh, will be for FY23. So we have a balanced budget. Um, this is a conservative budget as far as um, what we will receive um, from a, a state and federal perspective, those numbers are just held harmless, so there's no, I don't have any new monies put into that. Um, and then also, uh, we do have a $300,000 contingency in there. Um, again, mostly that covers our special education costs because we never know when a student's gonna move in with us that has significant needs. Um, we do, we have had a couple students that were residentially placed, some of our highly significant students. Um, so we are uh, required to pay their tuition to those schools and sometimes their room and board. Uh, we did have two students that left us last year, so we no longer have residency, residentially placed students, but they could come to our district at any point in time, and that's um, a very expensive uh, expenditure. So again, that contingency that we put in there is always for special education costs or any unforeseen um, teachers that we would need to hire uh, just based on employment or anything for <coughs> purposes, so all of our related services, just making sure that um, we're at that, that uh, threshold that we need to get. I think that's all that I have. Oh, I did just put up here for cash flow purposes, um, most of our money is still pretty liquid. Um, we're just not seeing 
really good rates to go out any further. And again, just trying to keep everything where if we needed to, to get that money, it's, it's liquid, so it's not tied up in anything. Um, we do put a lot of our money in savings deposit accounts, which um, it's a little different than just our liquid asset fund. Um, so we get a little higher interest rate on that, but you are able to pull that money out whenever you need, you need to get it. Um, we don't have any tax anticipation warrants. Um, we don't foresee that we will need that for cash flow purposes, uh, which is great news for us because we know how much that costs in the interest rate. So. so now I think that's the end of my presentation. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Don't all talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you got that. my own sake of knowing, is there, I know the district carries, which is typical, long-term debt, that debt repayment, like, are there opportunities to, to make advance payments on it if we have a lot of liquid funds, or is that something that, yeah, I'm sure it has some costs to do that in terms of, like, opportunity. But. Yeah, you are able to pay down your debt. Um, there's a couple different avenues you can do that. Like, you can do it with working cash fund dollars. Or um, if you utilize the 1% sales tax, if you collect that money, you're able to use that money and pay down the debt also. Um, obviously, that's something I think we would love to be able to do, but we haven't been able to in the past. We just haven't had the excess fund balance to do that. We do, we do look at that every year as part of the bond, the bond restructure, because some of those debt payments we can't prepay. Yeah, some of them are called bonds. Yeah, yes. Well, and, and I guess tied on the fund balance at 30% with a goal at 25%, is that that 5% buffer just kind of like we're expecting it. I mean, I imagine some of that's tied to the ESSER funds and, and like you're talking about them, I mean, that 5% is not a, a huge uh, or significant amount to say, oh, you take that and sure. make an advance payment or anything. Yeah. So. And we, I mean, we know what our expenses are going to be projected out for the next couple of years also just with our contracts in place, so that number probably most likely will go down a little bit, um, so we definitely won't be adding a ton to the fund balance. Um, we come down a little bit, actually, so. so. I always find the percent to be misleading because I know when we were looking at it last year when you transit into actual days, it's only like 60 days of operation. Yeah, in your <laughs> it's not a ton, so I mean, yeah, Spiritual. for some reason we stopped getting state payments. Um, which has happened. Which has definitely happened. Yes. Um, you know, we wouldn't have enough cash on hand to make payments or so. And 25%, like when it goes to 15%, is that when you need the tax anticipation warrants? Or what's 10%? 10%, right? yeah. And you said 60 days was what that 25% relates to? I think. It's I somewhere don't, yeah. like, yeah. Okay. It, I really like the visuals on this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, you can thank Allie <laughs> for the way she assisted you with those. Okay, so then um, our hearing um, will be September 27th, so we'll have the 30 day window in between. Um, and so then I think Jim, you'll just have to. Oh, yeah. Uh, is there a motion to approve the resolution for adoption of tentative budget and establishment of hearing date um, as presented? Mm -hmm. Okay. You've been seconded. Any further discussion? Roll call. Davey? Yes. Benito? Yes. Jones? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Wren? Yes. Shiloh? Yes. Dombeck? Yes. Motion carried. Report. Good evening. I think I have the shortest report uh, of anybody tonight. I really only have one agenda item, uh, which has to do with what's that? <laughs> I'm not upset about it. Uh, not at all. Um, the Sycamore Education Foundation, um, the SEF board, uh, after a transition in leadership in, in SEF, took that opportunity to kind of take a look at the agreement, the, the MOU. With the school district. So, um, you all know that we were able to hire Lauren Holtz uh, away from the, uh, uh, the foundation. She's now a director of communications. 
that vacancy created the opportunity. Um, when there's a transition like that, it's a really good practice to just kind of take a, a step back and reflect on what the structure of the organization is like or the any changes that need to be made. So um, I just want to point out it's not really born out of any concern, just took advantage of, of the opportunity. Uh, after discussion, the uh, board felt it would be beneficial for the executive director to no, no longer be employed by the school district. So part of the MOU was that the executive director was officially an employee of the school district. Um, there were some advantages there, some of which will remain in place, um, some will change. Uh, so for example, um, the executive director was previously paid through the school district and reimbursed by the foundation. That won't be the case anymore. The executive director is paid directly. <coughs> Uh, it is a part-time position. That, that's what it was previously. Uh, at some point, we all hope that the foundation grows large enough that it's a full-time position, maybe even needs additional staff, but right now it's a, it's a part-time position. <clears throat> because the foundation provides a significant benefit to the students in the school district, um, it really is in our best interest to, to partner with them and provide some resources to the executive director. For example, uh, there will still be office space in the administration building for the executive director. Uh, as well as being uh, able to use district technology, a laptop, and other supports like printing, copying, things like that. For the work that they do and the benefit that the school district gets, um, uh, I think it's very reasonable, so that remains in place. Uh, it continues to be a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, the, MO, the updated MOU reflects that. Um, attorneys for both the school district and an attorney on the SCF board have both reviewed the updated MOU uh, they are both okay with it. Um, it was actually a, a pretty easy update, uh, although you know, there's a lot of language that, that touched on these topics, but uh, we are ready. The SAF board approved it at their last meeting, um, so we're ready for the board to approve it and, and put it in place. Any questions for me? It's a much cleaner MOU. It's a much cleaner MOU, yeah. That was kind of the... Mm -hmm. <coughs> Is there a motion to, uh, do we need to approve this? Yeah. yeah. Is there a motion to approve the uh, MOU agreement um, with uh, SEO? So moved. Second. Any discussion? So I, uh, a, a little while ago, we had a, a person come to speak about uh, stoplight over at North Grove, um, by North Grove, and it uh, you know, brought up to me some progress that was made with the board and some discussion. I was hopeful that there was maybe some other opportunity where there may be public conversation about it or some gauge of interest by the district uh, constituents. I don't know what that might look like, but I wanted to do uh, the service of bringing this to the board and at the very least to get any feedback. Maybe it could be a future agenda item or if maybe it would be better suited uh, to follow up directly to this person or maybe even it could look like a, a survey, an optional survey. I, I'm not. I'm not sure what we could do uh, other than what we've already done, which was uh, all. All of us say we supported it, and uh, uh, to let the city know that we support it, so they, I mean, they know. It seems that they should take their conversation to the city mm -hmm. yeah. and have it there, and yeah. with us, because yeah. we can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. The city and the county, and the county, county together. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. And I think we made both entities know. Uh, we support it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a great thing. Be a great thing for our, That's our kids and uh, and the personal and the tree. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All three locations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but I think yeah, their their real push is with the county. So mm -hmm. again, 
one does. Uh, anything right. we can do to tag on, we're yeah. more than happy to do it. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, I don't think you know. It doesn't. I don't think we need a survey. Everybody's going to be in favor of that. As long as we're, yep, I think we're doing everything we can to do that. As long as I get. I think so. I, uh, you know, I and, and I've talked to the mayor about it. Um, I know that I think the city wants it too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's, it's going to be kind of an I dot issue. Yeah. And that approval is running anywhere from six to twelve months once paperwork is filed. If paperwork is filed. So, I think probably part of the part of the discussion that the city and the county are going to have is who's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we certainly can't. Can we get an update at some point from maybe Mark on um, <coughs> the, solar, the solar projects that we were looking at? Yeah, I was just looking through my email. I saw the last time we had an update was I think back in February on it. There was some report that was being done to look at what the credits would be. Yeah. I'm curious to know what. He's Mark. He's actually going to do a construction update at the second board meeting in September. So sure. we can give you guys an update on that because we've actually had Mark with some other conversations with other entities. So. I was a little surprised to uh, read that Luda uh, is welcoming the Chicago school district into their ranks. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right to me. Well, it uh, let me just say it was a surprise. To you're not the only one who's surprised. Let's okay. put it that way. Uh, it is nice to have CPSs involved with uh, Luda, the large urban district association. So to have them involved um, can benefit. The, the association, I can I can see where there might be potential drawbacks also, but I um, I think it's good that they're interested in, in being part of that. Uh, Twenty five years in education, CPS typically operates as its own entity. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're part they of the have their own problems, and they're I mean they're they're just different. Yeah, they, they, they get their money first, and the rest of it's a, yeah, they're billions. <laughs> it's a different entity. Um, It'll be interesting to see how they mesh with uh, the members of Luda and um, how they can support you know, Luda initiatives. But yeah, that was that was a surprise, and it really is a result of CPS approaching Luda about being a member, not the other way around. So yeah, the way the way they phrased it, that's how I took it. Yeah. So we'll we'll see how that develops over time. But so it, uh, it'll be curious. Yeah. I'll be curious to see how it goes. Uh, Luda annual conference is uh, coming up this fall. Uh, I can't remember if it's September or October, maybe. <coughs> uh, they have a, an annual fall and annual spring conference, and then uh, there's a summer institute or spring institute. Uh, that'll be the first opportunity to, to attend there with representatives from CPS and the other districts that are part of it. So uh, we'll see see how it goes. Very interesting. <laughs> I agree. Keep us posted. <laughs> I'm sure the newsletter will keep us posted. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Other um, issues, observations, or questions? I think we have a meeting coming up on, on looking at, at district boundaries and whatnot. I'd be curious just to know with all the construction going on in South DeKalb County, how much of that, you know, what that's going to impact our population. It's just the you know, zoning committee's been talking about where if we start receiving 200 residents a year or something like that, where that construction would be taking place. I guess I'm somewhat curious to know with the EBF formula, even though it doesn't direct us or affect us directly, is how that relates to DeKalb. If they're going to get have billions of dollars of construction going in there, does the hold harmless with the EBF mean they get kind of get to keep all that money plus all this new tax revenue will be on top, or does that ever get shaken out of the? I mean, you mentioned we move tiers. Is it possible that they move the other direction with all that? I mean, how, how do we get <laughs> balanced out in this? Because we're going to get a lot of impact from that construction or from the, the inflow of people without the, the tax revenue base. That, I yeah, well, I think I think it'll it'll depend how much construction they get, and it'll depend what their revenue base mm -hmm. turns out to be. Uh, and then if that if that offsets the you know, the poverty percentage, uh, then they could they could change to change. You know, it would be interesting also, I attended a Chamber of Commerce meeting last week and 
what we're hearing countywide is that a lot of new um, employees of, of new businesses, Meta and the like, actually are, are commuting um, Aurora, Naperville, whatever. So uh, the Cal County Economic Development Council is really starting to make a push to, to market the Cal County, not just to Cal, but the Cal County to a lot of those new employees. So uh, we're hoping that they, they want to stay and be residents here and, and influence our community. But, um, that's kind of the, the preliminaries that we're hearing that they're going you know, to neighboring communities, not necessarily staying here in the Cal County. So that'll be interesting too. Property taxes are going to go up because there's you know, new buildings going up. Um, we're not really sure what the influx of families and students you know, might have to be. Those are things to watch for sure. <coughs> Other uh, issues, items, future agenda items? Well, do you know what the progress was of that large solar farm in, I think, the south part of DeKalb County? I know when, we, when it was at least like, being more highly talked about, there was like this talk of huge amount of revenue that would come into Sycamore. Is that 2023? Is that going through? Do you? So we're not getting in from anything from that one. We're only getting money from the one out of Claire because that's the only one that's in our schools. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The one, the one that they're going to be putting in by the airport, is that, is is that, that a name of our district? It just, just misses our district. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know we have some, we have some land out there. We have Portland out there yeah. that mm -hmm. across the street. Yes. Is that 2023 one? Executive session for the consideration of matters related to the appointment, employment, discipline, or dismissal of personnel, student discipline, matters related to individual students, purchase or lease of real estate, and permanent litigation. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call. Benito? Yes. Jones? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Ren? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Davy? Yes. Salmon? Yes. Motion's yes. yes. Back in regular session, uh, is there a motion to approve the personnel report as presented? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call. Nelson? Yes. Ren? Yes. Shiloh? Yes. Davey? Yes. DeVito? Yes. Jones? Yes. Dombeck? Yes. Motion carried. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Please stand adjourned.